Welcome to episode 211 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent on a mission to show you who the FBI is and what the FBI does through my books, my blog, and my podcast case reviews with former colleagues. Today, we get to speak to retired agents, Billy Ebersol and Ozzy De Jesus. Billy was in the FBI for 22 years and Ozzy for 23. In this episode, they review a Colombian drug trafficking cell that had a shipment of 1,000 kilograms of cocaine hidden inside big metal chlorine gas containers at the Dundalk Terminal near Baltimore. Billy, the case agent, had his informant introduce Ozzy, the undercover agent, to the traffickers to arrange to transport the cocaine from Baltimore to New York. It was a very successful undercover sting. After this case, Billy and Ozzy went on to work on other successful cases, and in retirement, they continued to work together as security managers for Disney Cruise Line. You can learn more about Billy Ebersol and Ozzy De Jesus' careers in this episode's show notes at jerrywilliams.com. I think you're really going to enjoy this episode. Billy, Ozzy, and I had a discussion about informants and trust that you're not going to want to miss. This is actually the second time I've done an episode with both the case agent and the undercover agent. The last time was episodes 138 and 139 when I spoke to Ray Morrow and Dan Estrom about a Cleveland police corruption case. I also bring this up because Ray has recently published his true crime book about the case. It's called Broken Shield, an FBI undercover agent's personal perspective, and it is a remarkable narrative. You can find more information and a link to Ray's book in the show notes of episodes 138, 139. I also have a write-up in my September reader team email. More about that later. And I've added it to my FBI reading resource. As I just mentioned, the September reader team email is out. So check your inbox. If it's not there, please check your spam filter. I apologize. With the move, things just got so crazy busy that I did not get the August reader team email out. So you have twice the good stuff in this one. To include a few images of my new home in Raleigh, North Carolina, and a review for FBI misconceptions and cliches of season three of Ozark, one of my favorite shows. Of course, I want to welcome new listeners and invite you to join my reader team. This podcast is all about true crime, but if you're also interested in crime fiction, once a month via my monthly email, I keep you up to date on the FBI in books, TV, and movies. When you join my reader team, you get access to my FBI reading resource, which is a colorful list of more than 50 books about the FBI written by the FBI agents who have been guests on this podcast. There's nonfiction, crime fiction, true crime, and memoir. You can join my reader team on my website or use the link in your podcast app's description of this episode. I want to thank you for your support. Now here's the show. I want to welcome my guest, Ozzy De Jesus and Billy Ebersol. Hi, guys. How you doing? Good. How are you? Hello, Jerry. Well, I'm excited because the last time I did a case review with the case agent and the undercover agent, it was a huge success. Billy, you were the case agent and Ozzy, you were the undercover agent. So who's going to start? Who wants to start first? I think I'll start, Jerry, with just some background on the case and then lead into Ozzy and his observations as the UC. Okay, great. I think that's a good idea. Well, upon graduation at Quantico, I was assigned to the Newark field office, and I got to work for a terrific supervisor out there, Ed Hanko, who was in charge of the Colombian South American Caribbean Drug Task Force. And that's where I first met Ozzy. So we are talking about 1997 
when this case developed, the Tratados Chemicals case, that's the title of our case, Chemical Treatments, that was the phony company that the subjects down in Colombia created to facilitate the shipment of drugs. It was the Friday before President's Day weekend. Ed came into the squad area and said, we need a Spanish-speaking agent to come in Saturday morning. Ed Corrigan, a very good senior agent out of Atlantic City, had someone who wanted to cooperate on drug cases up north, and they needed a Spanish speaker. So I agreed to do it and came in. I met Ed, who drove all the way up from Atlantic City to Newark and introduced me to the informant. The informant only spoke Spanish and had a pretty severe speech impediment. We sat down, we went through it, spent pretty much the full day. And I was very grateful to Ed, as I am to all of my FBI mentors who helped me out along the way. We got a lot of detailed, current, specific information from the informant. I spent a couple hours after the debriefing going through the old ACS system, and there's not a lot of folks that will remember that system anymore. But the informant's details were spot on, and the informant implicated their involvement in ongoing drug trafficking. In fact, a 500 kilo load had just been orchestrated by the informant. So we knew we were dealing with a good informant. That Tuesday morning, I came back in, I typed up all of my debriefings, and later on in the afternoon, the informant called me and said, hey, I have mil kilo de coca for you, which means I have a thousand kilograms of cocaine. Now, I had been a state narcotics agent and I had been a prosecutor on a drug task force up in Pennsylvania before I joined the Bureau. So I like to say I knew just enough about informants to get myself in trouble. I had opened and closed about 17 my first year in the Bureau and uh, really gravitated towards working informants, enjoyed it. But a thousand kilos of cocaine is an awful lot for an informant that you just met two or three days ago. I had spent my career up to that point working ounce cases of cocaine or eight ball cases of cocaine, which is a 3.5 gram delivery. So that was a shock to my system. I got some more details out of the informant. And the informant had said that this came into the country at the port in Baltimore, which is not a normal port for drug traffickers. The normal ports would be Miami or New York or San Diego. And the informant said that the cocaine was hidden inside these big metal chlorine gas containers that the American oil companies used in Venezuela. And what the criminal conspiracy did was they shaved the inside of the chlorine gas container down so the container weighed a lot less than what it should have. And then they filled it with cocaine. And the informant further related that the load was hot, which meant the conspirators thought police were looking at it. Some form of law enforcement was looking at it. It was in a storage locker off the port in Baltimore. So really, the informant was being tasked to find someone to go pick up the load on behalf of the leadership of the conspiracy. What we thought we would do is try and insert an undercover here. And the conspirators were pretty smart. And Ozzy and I talked about it in preparation for this recording. And we also talked about it at the time of the case. It's likely that the subjects had used the Baltimore port before and they had some connections down there. So what do you mean? Somebody who worked at the port or somebody in customs? Somebody who worked at the port, somebody in customs or other conspirators in the area that could go pick up the drugs. So I got to I got to backtrack and just ask you one question because I'm just really curious. You know, this is a person that is speaking you know, fluent Spanish and has a speech impediment. Where did you learn Spanish well enough to be able to, you know, understand what he was saying? I had 28 college credits in Spanish, went to program in Spain, and also from Ozzy yelling at me repeatedly in Spanish. I was at least (laughs) able to pick up the corrective terms that Ozzy used. Okay. And it, it was one of those things where being on a Colombian drug squad, you had to use it all the time anyway. So I had been on the squad for about a year and the guys were good. To this day, Ozzy still helps me with my Spanish 23 years later. I wish I spoke Spanish. Well, I'd known I wanted to do drug work since I was younger. So Spanish was definitely the language. And to this day, it's probably the fastest growing language in the U.S. So definitely a worthwhile investment. And I'm encouraging my kids to take it up as well. So we thought there might have been a subject or other subjects down in Baltimore that facilitated prior deliveries, maybe some test cases, just to make sure that they could get the drugs through without attracting too much law enforcement attention. So we we asked Ed Hanko about this, our supervisor. He made some calls and talked to DEA and Customs down in Baltimore. And sure enough, they had awareness of the drugs coming in, but their concern was they didn't know who the subjects were. 
apparently four subjects had rented cars in New York to come down and check out the drugs. And the subjects, once they rented the cars, they switched up the vehicles. So there's no way that the person who rented a vehicle was actually driving it to confuse law enforcement further. So at some point, when the conspirators showed up at the warehouse down in Baltimore, they noticed some surveillance units. They got scared. They jumped on Interstate 95 and drove north at maybe 15 or 20 miles an hour on Interstate 95. And what that did is that caused the surveillance units to stick out even more. So these folks had been burned in the surveillance and were not sure if they could even bring charges against anyone at this point. So our informant became key to making this a prosecutable case. At some point during the Tuesday briefing, my training agent indicated he just didn't want to work the case. He thought it wasn't worth our time. But I was looking at it like this is a thousand kilo load. The people that are trusted with this probably have a pretty good track record with the cartels back in Colombia. So taking them off, not just for the arrest purposes, but for the intelligence development purpose was very important. And I got pretty frustrated at that point. And that's where I met Ozzy. He came along, walked around the corner, talked to me about the case and said, come on. So we went back to see Ed and explained the benefit of working this case in terms of informant development and disrupting a major cocaine trafficking network out of a a relatively unknown port at that time. And Ed agreed to let us work it. And Ozzy offered to be the undercover in this because it was critical. We couldn't rely on the informant's testimony. So it was critical that we had a reliable witness in there who understood the culture and understood the method of trafficking for the Colombians. Back then they were using cells. So you could have a group of people who harvested the cocaine, a different group of people who treated it and processed it, different group of people who transported it, and a different group that was the distribution. And that was by design so that if one cell got taken off, there was only so many people that would be lost by the organization and they couldn't squeal on folks in other cells. So it was a big deal for Ozzy to step up and help a new guy. I was still on probation at that time and I felt pretty confident in my abilities handling the informant, but there's still that early time period in the Bureau where they're still working drugs in a more conventional manner. And this was a unique manner. It was a gamble that the informant was telling the truth. We had to take some time. We had to take agent resources. And obviously it was Aussie safety because at this point, the bad guys know that police are involved and they're looking for someone basically to see if the police will respond. And if not, What are they going to do to the undercover once the drugs are out there? So that was a big concern to make sure that Ozzy would be safe throughout the undercover as we cultivated the intelligence. What helped us not only was Ozzy's Spanish ability, but his understanding of the culture and his ability to sell himself, not just to the informant, which is important, but also to the criminal subjects. They had to believe that Ozzy was the real deal. And at this point, I'll turn it over to Ozzy so he can give us his boots on the ground observations of being a UC. Well, Ozzy, before you start, I just want to recognize what Billy was saying, that this is such a dangerous operation for you because they're already suspicious. They already know that law enforcement is looking. So anybody who approaches them, they're going to assume at first until you prove differently that you're law enforcement. It didn't cross my mind until the first meeting when, you know, the way that the meeting happened. It's when I, when I felt like, hmm, it's kind of hairy right now because it happened at a parking lot at night. A lot of cars park and, and even though there's surveillance around me, I really didn't know who was in those cars. So it could have been anything, but. Let me give you a little bit of my background. As, as Billy said, I, I was on the same squad, the uh, Colombian, South American, Caribbean drug squad. And I've been there for five years by then. So I have worked a good number of cases with Colombians. And I have handled a number of Colombian informants also by then. So I, I was experienced with their culture, the, you know, what motivates the, the informants to cooperate with us. I was familiar with the with the different accents, the jargons, the, the superstitions. So when Billy approached me with the information, 
And I listened to it. I knew I knew what he was talking about. It, it makes sense because, like I said, I've done I've done all the cases before where it's a sale and they are using some sort of there's a service they're providing to the to the organization. This one it happens to be transportation. So when uh, Billy approached me and he told me, "Hey, I have an informant that's sitting on a thousand kilos of cocaine, or, or have a soldier that's sitting on a thousand kilos of cocaine." Well, that got my attention. Because like Billy said, thousand kilos of cocaine, that's very substantial. And and another thing is that he said that the informant is talking to the supervisor of this law, which is also very important. Like Billy said, this is a this is very good intel. This is an opportunity to possibly disrupt a sale. And also because Billy was new in the squad and you're dealing with with other jurisdictions, other agencies. You have to help all the, all the agents with that when you have multi jurisdiction because it can get complicated. So after talking to him, I said, well, let's go talk to Ed and I'll explain to Ed the significance of the case. And you know what, Billy? One of the things that I that I they remember that why Ed agreed to to work this case too. You remember Ed was a police officer in Baltimore. That is correct. So, he spent a so, number of years. Right. So that that probably was the reason why he said. Yeah, let's do this. I mean, a, a trip to Baltimore. So we we decided to meet with the source, which, like Billy said, the the first step when you're talking to a Colombian source that is involved with a group that can transport a thousand kilos of cocaine, this is a very important subject. This these are subjects that have the ability to control a thousand kilos of cocaine. That's $25 million of drug that this subject is sitting on. It. This is a very, very high target. So when you're dealing with a source that can talk to someone like that, you have to convince this source that you know what you're doing and that you understand how drug traffickers work, what they're looking for, what, what are the uh, steps that you have to take, precautions and all that stuff. Of course, I'm not asking you to identify by name, but who who is the source and why do you and Billy trust him? What is he, what's his motivation? Well, it, it was Billy's source. One of the things that I always, my rule was that it's your source, you handle it. You are the one that, that's going to know all the intimates. I don't, I don't want to be involved with your source. I did, you know, talk to the source and I, I we sat, back, we talked to him, we sat down we explained what our plan was going to be and why we were able to do this. Bailey, did you want to the, add what the motivation was? Yes, I believe the primary motivation was to get a claim to citizenship in the United States. The informant had multiple convictions, so would be excludable. However, U.S. Congress has authorized 180 S visas per year for top-level drug and terrorism informants. So ultimately, the informant was looking for some claim to legitimate residency, which we did get, and we can go into that in a little bit, but it it is a very involved process. It took me about 18 months to do it, and the reason why we trusted the informant was because of the pedigree. There was a lot of very specific, timely, firsthand information. We didn't think there was a subsource involved. The informant was from Colombia and was a tractor-trailer driver. And tractor trailer drivers are key when you're dealing with importer investigations because the drugs, 90% of the drugs at the time were coming from Colombia, heroin and cocaine, and they were hitting our ports and tractor trailer drivers were needed out. So there was a logical reason for the informant to be approached. And we did cooperate a lot of it in ACS. So I'll turn it back over to Ozzy and he can explain how he got into the conspiracy. So after convincing the source to, you know, to introduce me to, to the subject, which to me, that will be the first thing that is going to prove that this source is for real. If I meet with someone and that person is telling me about this law or about what they need, then, you know, the source's job is done because now I'm, I'm targeting on the subject. So he was able to they call the, the subject and convince the subject to agree to meet you know with me he just told me i have someone that can drive a truck but one of the things also that 
that I remember was I told this the uh, source to let the the sergeant know that I was not Colombian, but I was Puerto Rican. And the reason for that is because one of the things that I learned from Colombians traffickers is that they prefer to do business with all the Colombians. And the reason for that is if you're a trafficker that is handling handing a uh, thousand kilos uh, of cocaine to someone to to move for you, you want some insurance. So being a Colombian national, that means that you ha- you most have relatives living in Colombia. If something happened to this to the law that I just gave you, I'm going to go after your family in Colombia. When I told this this source, you had to tell this subject that I'm not Colombian, I'm Puerto Rican. That right there was a test because the subject can come back and say, well, I don't want to meet with someone unless they're Colombian because I want insurance. I was surprised that the subject said, yeah, I agreed to, to me, which then tells me these guys are desperate because I'm, you know, I'm not Colombian. The other thing that went to my mind at the time was this might be another agency targeting the source. They're looking for, they're looking for a reverse. But, but I was pretty sure that it was not the case based on all the, all the uh, details from Billy. You know, he checked everything and it didn't sound like anybody else. Besides, also, because we had, I think, Billy, you already had talked to customs down in, in Baltimore about the right. So that kind of took that out of, out of the equation. So moving forward, we, we met and we decided to have the first meeting, the Vince Lombardi truck stop, car stop in the New Jersey Turnpike. And the reason we picked that is because, you know, that's a truck stop. There, it's be natural to have a tractor trailer there. It's out of the way. You have to be in the turnpike and stop there so you can control the area better, know who's coming in and, and going out. So we, that was the place that we decided to meet. We went to the meeting, the source and myself, and I remember waiting for the the source to talk to the sergeant. The sergeant said, yeah, I'm here. And I remember I'm, I'm standing on the sidewalk in front of the building of the of the rest stop and seeing the sergeant walking towards us. And the source saying, that's the guy. So we went and we met with the uh, subject in the parking lot. I introduced myself. I own a tractor trailer company. I have a tractor trailer. I understand that you need something moved from Baltimore to New York. He said, yeah. He said, do you have the trailer here? I said, and, and we were working with Customs, and we were lucky that Customs had a undercover tractor trailer at the time and a driver who drove the, the, trailer, the tractor trailer to the, to the rest stop. Now, do you know how to drive a tractor trailer? No, I do not. And oh. Billy, do not say the joke that I cannot reach the pedals. <laughs> <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> but I did not. So, and that was the only thing that we discussed. It's like, I don't know how to drive a tractor trailer. And Billy said, no, our customers have one in, in, a, in a driver, so we'll use them. It's okay. So we had the tractor trailer there. Actually, one of the things, too, that I remember going back is this case was going so fast that that was what the first time that I met the, the UC on customs and saw the tractor trailer right there before the meeting. And uh, I said, okay. So when the subject was with us and, and he wanted to see the tractor trailer, I wa- I'm walking towards the truck and the, I guess the UC saw us coming. So he got out of the, the, the truck and is walking towards the building which I'm looking at and I said, okay. So I pointed to him and to the, and told the subject, that's my driver. He's non-Hispanic because I don't like Hispanics driving my trucks when there's something on it because law enforcement is not going to be looking for uh, drugs and, and somebody who's not Hispanic, which is like a stereotype, but they believe that. So the UC goes into the building. I stay with the subject. They want to see the back of the truck. We open the back of the truck, it's empty, and they like, say, okay, we, we like this. So we walk back towards the parking lot where we first met, and we talking, and so he's playing to me, you know, I have a load on there, needed to move it to, to Queens, and he said, if you remember, he said an address in Queens, the, and the source was pretty good because the source interjected and said, no, I don't like that place, that place is dangerous, why don't we go to someplace else? 
and then they, the subject came up with another location. I mean, at this point, I not really care about that because we're going to arrest these people before we even go down to Baltimore. So they, they kind of, he kind of made it look uh, more real by saying things like that. When, when I introduced myself, I told, I told the subject, I have done other uh, jobs with the source. He knows that I'm, that I'm good, that I'm not going to, you know, do anything bad. I'm very cautious on how I do things. I like to have everything clear before I do anything. So the subject was, was happy uh, with that. One of the things the subject did ask me when I was uh, talking to him is he wanted to see my driver's license, which I said, uh-oh, I get my driver's license, my UC driver's license. But I remember at the time, I didn't have a CDL driver's license, a commercial driver's license. It was just a regular driver's license. And, and I didn't have a, a, a hazmat endorsement either, which is, is a, an endorsement from the, from the uh, government for you to transport chemicals in your truck. So when I handed the driver's license, he looked at it for a little bit and they handed it back to me. And I'm thinking, oh, if, if he never calls, it's probably because he, you know, or, he or if he asked me, why don't you have a, a, a CDO driver's license? It would have been, well, I don't drive the truck. You know, my employee does it. But that was one of those old, old times when he asked me for my driver's license. It looked like everything was going okay. He said, okay, so what are we going to do? And he, he suggested that he wanted to do this fast. So we arranged for a, to meet at the same place on a following day to drive down to uh, Baltimore in a caravan and, uh, and pick up the load put it in the truck and take it to New York. When he said that, I said, okay, one question, do you have a way to load this, this material into the truck? Because I don't do loading. So I drive, we drive, but we don't load the truck. You're going to have to do that yourself. He goes, no, no problem. I have, I have people that are going to go uh, down there with me to help us load the truck. So I told her, well, before we go down there, I need to meet them because I want to know exactly who's going to be there with us. So there will be no misunderstanding when we're down there. He said, oh, no problem. We will we'll meet here tomorrow. I, I forgot what day it was, like a couple of days later on the week. You can meet them, and when everything is good, then we can go drive down to Baltimore. Another thing that I remembered uh, during the meeting was that we're standing in the parking lot, in the middle of the parking lot, and they, they are getting very close to me. The subject and when and the following day, the other subjects, they're like very uncomfortably close to me, like in my personal space, which I thought, well, maybe they don't want nobody else to hear the conversation that is going on here. But then I think, well, this is great because they're getting very close to my recording device that I'm wearing, which it was good for capturing the conversation. So when they did that, I made sure that I asked them, okay, We understand that we are driving down to Baltimore and we are going to be loading cocaine into the back of the truck. Oh, you said it that plainly and clearly? Yes. And uh, and the reason I did is because, again, I don't want no misunderstanding. Again, I'm not Colombian, so I'm I'm acting like I'm, you know, I'm outside of your group. I don't want you later on to tell me that, no, it was not drug in in there, you know, or or the quantity was less. I don't get cheated. So that's why I told them, you know, I want to make sure that we understand what we're doing. And they, yeah, no, 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 that's exactly what we're doing. And we're going to pick, up, pick it up and, and you're going to get paid. Because if you look at it, the, the, at the time, transportation from, from Miami to New York on one kilo of cocaine was about $2,000 just to move it to New York. You're not in, in Miami, but it's still, this is 1,000 kilos. That was a lot of money in real, you know, if I was doing this for real, a lot of money that, that I'm looking to earn from this transportation. So when I made that point that I want to make it clear, it makes sense because the soldier asked me, what do you have to be so clear? I said, because I want to get paid my money and I don't want you to cheat me on my money. The reason that I was doing that is because I want him to say on tape, why was he doing, incriminate himself, which they did. So we met on the day, we had the conversation, when we ready to the, get on the cars and leave, that's when the order to the takedown came down and we were all arrested, including me, by customs and FBI. 
the premise of the case was not even to go down to Baltimore to actually get the drugs. Did somebody already have their eyeball or their hands on the drugs down in the port in Baltimore? That's correct, Jerry. DOJ policy says when you have that level of drugs, we're talking over one ton of cocaine, you either seize it in place or you have to convoy it, which means you've got surveillance units 24-7 driving up 95 to make sure that that cocaine is safe and doesn't enter the stream of commerce. So based on our leadership in the Bureau, the decision was made, we need to take it off down there. We'll arrest the subject separately. So the second meeting at the Vince Lombardi truck stop went down about midnight. I was actually stuck in the elevator at the office. I went into the office to get some additional tactical gear. What? I got stuck. <laughs> yeah, I got stuck in between floors. Murphy's Law is alive and well in law enforcement. What can go wrong will go wrong. I was able to crawl out and I made it in time and I was paired up with a guy named Tom. Oh, you know, I had to stop you. That has got to be a scene in, you know, a TV show or somebody's book. Maybe one of mine because it's, it's, it's unbelievable. And it, it formed the basis for the rest of my career in the Bureau. So anytime <laughs> something went wrong, I would say, well, it can only get better than this. We're only going to go uphill. I was assigned to handle the informant and work with Tom Hayes, who is a customs agent. He's about seven foot tall. I'm about 5'5 five, five when I'm on my tippy toes. So they used to call Tom and I David and Goliath. So Tom and I are sitting back with the informant. We see the first car come in, and we know that's our subjects. I, I believe it was Oscar Orlando Alba and Luis Francisco Alba. And then we see another car come in, and that was Colombian Tradecraft. They would send the first car in to do the meet with the lower level uh, subjects. And they wanted to see if the police would spring. And then the leadership would come in in another car. So that second car came in and we radioed in. We had two arrest teams. The leader on the ground there was Lonnie Boudreau, another newer agent, but a very experienced, very credentialed agent. And then a third vehicle came in and this was a limo. And we thought, okay, this is the big enchilada here. And so Lonnie radioed out to myself and Tom, you got to take the limo. When we give the takedown signal, the two arrest teams will get the first two vehicles, and then Ebersole and Hayes will get the limo. So Lonnie made the call to take the arrest down because he did not want Ozzy getting in a car, going to Baltimore, because once the drugs were released, we did not know what the subjects would do to Ozzy. We didn't think they would pay him, so there were some horrible consequences if we went further. So everyone was taken into custody, and myself and Tom ran up and hit the limo. Unfortunately, they weren't involved. It was a couple involved in a romantic embrace as <laughs> we approached. And it's how I defined the largest seizure in my career, arresting a romantic couple. But needless to say, we were very happy with the results. This ended up okay. being the largest single seizure of cocaine in the history of Maryland. That's the reason, Jerry, that I, that I, had, it, I had to make sure that they made those comments on tape a mission that this is their law and this is what we're going to go do because we were never going to put them together with the law. So it was important that they said on the tape that this is our, you know, our cocaine and we're here to do that. And, and one of the things that I always thought about too is that the reason why they were okay doing the deal with a non-Colombian, me as a Puerto Rican, is that I got a feeling that their plan was to send me down there to the, to the storage unit sit back and see if I get arrested by, by police down there in Baltimore. If I got arrested, they didn't care because I'm not Colombian. You know, they don't have no alliances or you know, have to answer for me to anyone. If I didn't get arrested and, and I moved the law, one of the things that I, I, at the time I didn't know, if I, maybe once that the law is moving, they get rid of me. But it didn't matter because I knew I wasn't going to leave the parking lot. I think the other reason that you brought up is equally valid. There was external pressure. Jose Orozco, the leader of that cell, most likely was being told from the cartels down in Colombia, you either move the load or you get in trouble. Somebody so, in your family is going, to, is going to pay for it. Yeah. So they had pressure. They had to move at that point. Well, this answers a lot of questions that I had at the beginning, and that was about, you know, jurisdiction and territory, because the drugs are in Baltimore. 
And so I was wondering, you know, how the Baltimore division was involved in this investigation. Well, we called through our supervisor, Ed Hanko. We notified Baltimore. They deferred to Newark because we had the informant and we had an undercover. So at the time of the takedown, FBI Newark worked with DEA Newark, DEA Customs, and then Baltimore DEA and Customs came up. They were present for the takedown. We made the arrest. And then the Baltimore agents went back down and secured the drugs. That's quite a, quite a large amount of drugs to secure. And as we cleaned up the scene, we did the initial appearances for the subjects. The informant reached back out to me and said, hey, I'm getting word that there is a hit out on the FBI agent from this case. And we did not know, was that Ozzy or was it me? But to be fair, when you're dealing with these higher level informants, they have a lot of good information, and we'll get to that in a minute. They want to make sure they give that to the right person. They want to test your resolve, and they want to make sure that you can produce for him or her. And that's why this was important to do this first case and get credibility with the informant as an organization, because that informant could shop the information around just about anywhere. And if we could not put something on the table, the informant would have been done with us at that point. And Maybe a day or two later, the informant called and said, the day that you arrested these subjects, the conspiracy down in Columbia put another load that's at least as big, if not bigger, on the ship, and it's coming to Houston. So we knew to be watching for that load to come in. And there was a little bit of a concern because we're wondering, is that going to be an actual load of drugs or is it going to be booby-trapped? Could they be sending us something knowing that we're going to be looking for that type of packaging in chlorine gas containers? When you say booby trap, do you mean something that could actually be dangerous to the law enforcement who go to to search it? Yes, we were we were anticipating an explosive. So we set up what FBI Houston. And has that has that happened before? Oh, I'm sure it's has. I'm many drug dealers will set up some type of trap. They'll poison their drugs in hopes that a drug dog will ingest it. Meth Labs tend to be very dangerous with booby traps. It could be a punji stick. It could be an IED. It could be a spring-loaded shotgun. That's a relatively routine thing to think about when you work in drug trafficking. So we worked as a team, FBI Houston, DEA Houston, the representatives from Baltimore. We all got together and took down that load. That was 1,009 kilograms. And what was neat about it at that time a New York state trooper took off a thousand kilos in an abandoned tractor trailer in New York state. And then Vince Pancote out of Miami sees like 3,200 kilos coming up out of Columbia. So for about a week or two, you could not buy kilo level quantities of cocaine in New York because we had disrupted the market. And after that, the market got flooded, which is the nature of drug work. But it was a neat uh, opportunity to be a part of that ripple in drug enforcement, a small part of that ripple. and. The way that the FBI works is we don't just stop investigations when we make the arrest. We continue working even after the arrest. So we got the surveillance video from Baltimore DEA and reviewed it with the informant. And the informant was able to identify additional members of the conspiracy who were not present for the meeting with Ozzy, but they were out in California. And one of them was Carlos uh, Quiseno. And we were able to arrest him and another co conspirator. Kisena was the de facto head of the shipment here in the United States. And when I debriefed him for the first time with DEA and Customs, Kisena gave us enough info. We filled out an 18-page 302 on all the tradecraft that those folks were using. And that's where I, I got into more of the intelligence end of this. And we were able to share that information with a variety of agencies to be looking out for drugs coming in and drug proceeds going out of the United States. As I mentioned earlier, these level of informants are looking for credibility in the agents that handle them. And because we were able to do this initial case, we developed a number of other cases. For example, a grandmother was selling about $15,000 worth of heroin with her granddaughter in her arms, a toddler. And we were able to arrest that woman with the informant. And then that woman cooperated and led us into a case with 110 kilograms of cocaine with a customs agent. The informant was also able to testify against 800000 in cash that was seized out of a hidden wall in Morristown, New Jersey. 
the informant was fronted a full kilo of 92% pure heroin, and we were able to arrest three subjects there. And as I mentioned, an informant of this level justifies extra work by the handling agents. So we sat down and prepared an S visa for the informant and the informant's significant other. And they were granted after about 18 months of work. It has to be approved by FBI, by DOJ, by immigration. And you're essentially on probation as a, as a person who gets an S visa. So you must check in with your handling agent for three years to complete this probation. And at that time, Ozzy was headed to Puerto Rico and I was headed out to the Williamsport RA. So I kept the informant on the books to complete the probation. And during that time, the informant's stepson broke into a smurfing operation and stole a bunch of currency that was turned over to us and resulted in three additional arrests. And then the informant was out driving a tractor trailer in California and found some fresh welding marks on the tractor trailer, poked it open and found what was represented to me to be about 150000 in cash. The informant turned it over to me and I did some checking with DEA out in LA and it turned out the informant was stealing from a Mexican drug dealer. And it wasn't 150000 it was $1.5 million. So the informant was turning over a small amount to me in hopes of immunizing that illegal conduct. And at that point, then we revoked the S visa and the informant got into a lot of trouble. So uh, a key issue here with informant handling is never trust him. At the end of the day, like my old law professor would say, make sure it's the informant who goes to jail and not you. I like that. And, and honestly, this would not have happened, all of these cases, if Ozzy had not stepped up and helped a new guy. So for that, I was very, very grateful for that opportunity. A good informant will keep an entire squad of agents busy, especially in the drug world. I give the credit to Ed Hanko because he was one of the best supervisors that we had in the FBI. I got to know Ed because he ended up being the special agent in charge in the Philadelphia office. So I've got to know him and you know, he's a good guy. But I, I want to go back to this informant because I know you said never trust an informant, but you have to have developed a relationship. There has to be an element of trust because, say, in the case of Ozzy, you're undercover. His life is depending on this informant. So there has to be an element of trust, you know, when it comes to, you know, the, your safety and the safety of undercover. We, we had another, uh, this is not the first informant that Billy arrest uh, for stealing money or misrepresenting what they're doing. So I had, an inf I had a Colombian informant. That was your case also, Billy, right? The, yes. Uh, the informant in Elizabeth, New Jersey. She was also, she took, what, one, one million, I think it 1. was? 1.5 million in 18 right. months. And I had that informant for probably a couple of years, and, and she was giving me all kind of information and stuff, but you don't, you take your eye off of them and watch out. And I also had another informant in Philadelphia that DEA arrested that informant. I operated her for two years, and, and there, there's a lot of work because you have to be on top of them all the time. If you're not, they are going to do what they do best. The best informants that you, that you have in the FBI and law enforcement is those that participate in criminal activity. Honest people don't do good, good informants. <laughs> we call those liaisons. It's a matter of being a professional skeptic. You want to trust what they're doing, but you want to verify everything. Periodically, you want to test them, maybe change the meeting time or location. Just put a little spin on things and see how they react. I have always said, and I've handled many, many informants in drugs and counterterrorism, the moment that I become comfortable with informants is when I'll retire and go work somewhere else. because. When you let your guard down as a professional, you will get burned. And I understand that. And, and maybe it's different because, of course, I worked white collar crime and, you know, my informants were, in the most part, cooperating witnesses that were providing information. But I do know that even in the drug world and in the organized crime world, you do develop relationships. And so what I'm still asking you is, you know, here you were kind of vouching for this guy for three years. So you were meeting with him, you were talking to him, you knew his significant other, I'm sure if he had kids, you knew them. There still had to be, I don't know if the word, I, I, the word isn't hurt, but some type of really deep disappointment when you found out that your informant 
was lying to you and kind of screwing you over. D D Jerry, the first informant I dealt with was back in about 1993 or 1994. So it was a couple years before that. And this informant was burned on a case and ended up getting shot in front of City Hall in Scranton, Pennsylvania, where I used to work and where I'm originally from. And when you dig a little bit deeper, you find out, well, the informant was actually in front of City Hall dealing drugs without authorization. So there's always that professional skepticism. You have to watch how close you let yourself go. And they may think that we're the best friends that they have, but that's not necessarily the case. And you do go through this training in Quantico. And then when you get to a squad where it's informant intensive, you look for the mentors that train you in that professional skepticism so that you don't get burned and so that the agency doesn't get burned. Yeah, my, my first informant, Jerry, in Newark was a Colombian. We, we myself and another agent, drove to Albany. We, this guy was arrested on immigration violation. It was a scheme that were, they were selling a green card. So, but he, he wanted to cooperate and he had information on drug trafficking in, in the Newark area. So he gave us some information. We corroborated information. He did some introductions. He did a few things with us and he was working okay. And then one day I call him and no answer, call him, no answer, call him, no answer. The following day I got a call from him. He's now in this little town in southern Colombia, like almost in the Amazon jungle, called me and told me, sorry, I like you, you know, you good guy, but I cannot, I cannot work with you guys no more. So that was my first informant and my first fugitive because he was a, a fugitive then. And then, like you said, I was very disappointed and hurt and all that because I thought I was doing such a great job. That's when I decided, you know, not, this is not going to be personal no more. This is going to be business. So I never took any of the informants. I would pretend that I was their best friend and all that stuff, but it was business. I didn't want it to be that kind of relationship. If you do something criminal behind my back, then I'm going to be hurt. No, I'm going to put you in jail. And like Billy said, you know, one of my informants, Billy put in jail because it's like, yeah, she is doing this. Let's put her in jail. And I worked for, with that one for a couple of years. And there were some things that they were doing that it was good. But uh, to me, it was always, it was business. It's always business. And, and like Billy said, that's the, the best way to do it because you don't want to go to jail. You want the bad guy to go to jail. And if the informant is the one to decide to be a bad guy one day, well, then hey, go into jail, not me. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I, I think the difference is, again, in white collar crime cases, you usually are working with a cooperating witness. So somebody who may be involved in the criminal activity, the fraud or whatever, and they have information. And a lot of times they're cooperating, but they know they're going to get time for this particular case too, but they're trying to reduce their culpability and, and reduce their sentence. And so in most of those cases, they're not looking to do additional things to get themselves in jail because the only reason they're talking to you is to try to lessen, you know, to, to lower their level. So I, I never, I never experienced that, that skepticism I, that, that you're talking about. Interesting. I worked at a case uh, with customs in, in Newark, uh, and this was before Billy. It was a money laundering case. It was uh, a couple had an office where they do the money remaining, but they were laundering lots of money, like millions of dollars. And the couple who ran the, the, the operation, but they had an assistant. It was a, a young lady, Colombian. She, she would knew the whole, the whole scheme. She knew everything that was going on, who was dropping money. So when we did the arrest of the couple and we, we pick her up and we brought her to the office, to the customs office, I remember interviewing her and she gave me the whole thing. This is how they do it. This is who picked up. This is the customer, the whole thing. And we like, we were like buddies. And so at the end, when I, she said, well, you know, that's all I have. I said, okay, so let's, let's go in this back room. This is the processing room in customs where you, you know, your fingerprints. Well, Customs has a, a cell in their processing room, an actual cell, you know, like a jail. 
when she looked at it and she looked at me and I said, we got to make, take your fingerprints. She goes, why are you doing that? I said, well, you're under arrest. You understand that. And she goes, no. And she fainted and passed out. So they <laughs> called the medic. She didn't know that she talking to me like I'm her friend and she telling me everything. She thought she was just providing a little gossip for you. Right. And, and actually I, she was confessing. Right. And I, and the sad thing is that I, when we arrested, we read them the right. I said, you know, you got the right to remain. You don't have to say anything to me. You can go an attorney. And she agreed and she signed it and then she started talking. And I was like, okay. And, but it was funny because she, she fainted. Luckily we had an uh, ENT with us and, and we were able to revive her. When I talk to Colombians, I try to make sure that they understand that I understand them, that I know who they are, I know what they're, you know, what motivates them and, you know, all their superstition and all that stuff. I make sure that they do that. Another case that I work, the, the, the subject Colombian, that lady did not believe that I was Puerto Rican. She said, no, you from Colombia. And I'm like, no, I'm not from Colombia. I'm from Puerto Rico. No, you got to be from Colombia because you know too much about my hometown in Colombia. And I'm like, it's called research, lady. <laughs> but, so, but that's how you have to get involved with them to understand what motivates them. And the thing with Colombian is that, you know, with a lot of the drug traffickers is that it's all about themselves and money. It's the greed. People that, that are involved in drug trafficking, it's pretty much all about greed. They want money. Do you agree with that, Billy? How much of your career did you spend working these type of drug cases? Probably about 50% of the time of my career, which spanned 26 years. And I can tell you, greed is absolutely it. I mentioned the full kilo of heroin that the, the informant was able to get. That was initially provided to us with 330 grams. And we did not have money. We weren't funded to buy heroin. So we were just going to go out and arrest the subjects. And to facilitate the arrest, we told the subjects that they shortchanged us maybe 10 or 15 grams of heroin, which we calculated would have eaten up all their profits. So that caused the subjects to call us 17 times and say things like, I've never cheated anyone on a heroin deal before. That's great evidence in court. And what we finally said to the subjects was, well, just gather up all the heroin you have, bring it to us, and we'll settle up with one final payment. And these folks did. And they wow. showed up with 660 grams of heroin worth $83 a gram. And what was motivating them was they were going to lose their profit of maybe a couple thousand bucks and they ended up getting five years in jail. So this case exemplifies the fact that you need to know culture, you need to know behaviors. This was much more about culture and behavior than it was about appearance. And I think that's a, a lesson that we can all continue to realize. You have to understand the arena you're working in and what's significant and what is not significant. Can we also talk about evidence? Because this was one of the first case reviews that I've done on a, on a drug investigation where the main evidence was catching the subjects with the drugs. And in this case, it didn't happen. How confident were you and the prosecutors that you worked with that this was going to be enough to have a successful prosecution of these drug dealers? I, this is fascinating to me. We were very confident. And I think you're hitting on the fact that this was a non-traditional investigation. At the time, the traditional techniques would be make a couple buys of drugs, do a search warrant, and then arrest. And what we did was we developed a tripwire, which is what 9-11 taught us to have those tripwires out there. So it was a little bit ahead of its time. But don't forget, we had recorded conversations between Ozzy and the subjects. We had very detailed explanations as to how the drugs were packaged, how they got here. And the authorities down in Baltimore had uh, videotape, surveillance videotape of our subjects coming down. We knew who they were. We were able to match them up in the videotape so that they can be fully identified and properly charged. And then you also had toll records. You had the informant. If we had to, the informant was willing to testify. That would have been difficult because it would have prevented us from working additional cases. But ultimately, the informant would have been able to come in and, and seal the day. And I think with Ozzy's testimony, that would have been sufficient. But we always had the informant as plan B. 
And ultimately, we did go to court. First two subjects pled guilty. The third subject took a trial. Ozzy testified. We did not use the informant. We got a guilty verdict. And then Carlos Quiseno agreed to plead guilty and cooperate. So I think it was hitting them hard up front and knowing our facts, knowing our investigation and eliminating any of the excuses they might put forth at the time of the arrest. So we locked them into statements, and that helped us take care of business down the road. Yeah, during, during the trial in Baltimore, the defense attorney, the only thing that he questioned me was on the change of evidence, the tapes. And he didn't, he didn't ask me about what was in the table. He asked me was, when I did the recording, what I did with the recorder. And so I explained, I, I handed the recorder to the case agent. What did the case agent do with the recording? I told him, I don't know, because it's, you know, hearsay. But I said, but I can explain to you what the process is, which he said, well, explain to me what the process is. And I had to explain what the process was. You know, case agent takes the taste, takes it to, to our evidence uh, room, log it in, they put it into evidence, they let it make copy and so forth. So that's all I testify on. He didn't have anything else to ask, which to me, it, it, it tells me that, you know, you, you're just trying to earn your money because this is a dumb deal. There's, there's no way this guy's going to get off. A lost cause. Well, did you two work together on any other cases? Yes. We were actually laundering money for the North Coast cartel at one oh, okay. point. We worked on your informant. Ozzy was the UC on that, and I was part of his cover team. So I monitored the transmitter to make sure everything was good and then actually laundered the funds. I'm an accounting person. so. We had the proper authorizations to do that, and we did it in furtherance of identifying additional criminal activity and additional assets to seize. So we did that probably for a couple of years. And then Ozzy went to San Juan, and I went to Williamsport. And in July of 2000, I was tasked to help some Philadelphia agents do a marijuana reverse in Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. And that's where we show up as law enforcement with sham drugs and the bad guy or guys come up with a lot of cash and we rip them for the cash and charge them for a conspiracy. Well, I had driven down, I believe Sam Smimo was the case agent on that. And I was part of the entry team. So as I was running down, I was late. I got in the stack. I got caught up. I was briefed in quick. And Ozzy, I think was ahead of me. I had not seen Ozzy in a couple of years. Ozzy ran in to the room first into the house. And I was not aware, but Ozzy lit off some pepper spray because there was a dog in the house. So as I'm coming through with the entry team, I got a whiff of Ozzy's pepper spray. So um, that was the next Thanks, Ozzy. <laughs> what are friends for? We had worked together. So still very good memories. And uh, Jerry, one note on, that, on the case with uh, Orozco is that when Orozco asked me to see my driver's license, you know, I thought that he was trying to check who I was or, or if I had CDL license and stuff like that. And he didn't. But then when we arrested him and I look, I'm going through his personal property, his wallet, I found a driver's license in his wallet with my UC name, my UC DOB and address and his picture on it. That was my first experience with identity theft. Luckily, wow. it was my UC identity that, that he stole. Wow. So he had it long enough to memorize it. Wow. Yeah. He memorized all the information on my driver's license and copied it and made a driver's license for himself with my information. Later yeah. he know that it was no good. <laughs> <laughs> but that was, that was another crime he committed. That's fascinating. This was such a unique case. You know, whenever you see something on, you know, TV or in movies with somebody rushing into the port to, you know, grab the drugs. And so I do think it's real. you know, it was a great case review to give everyone, including me, you know, another look at how these uh, drug cases go down. That was the good old days. This was at the beginning of Billy's career, and I take it at a midpoint of your career, Ozzy. You ended up in Philadelphia, and that's uh, where we got to know each other. Why don't we move on to talk about the rest of your careers? I'd, I'd love to ask you both to share with us when you joined the FBI and, and why you joined the FBI. So I joined the FBI April 21st, 1991. After new agents class, I went to the newer division. Why did I join the FBI? 
Prior to the FBI, I was in the, in the Air Force, like your dad, served eight years with the U.S. Air Force. Coming to the end of the, of the second enlistment, like you said, your father traveled a lot. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to keep moving around. So I decided I wanted to leave military life and go join, into civilian. Join the FBI and move around a lot. <laughs> well, 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 this is why it's funny because I, uh, I wanted to be a civilian life, but I want to stay with the government because one of the things I learned when I was in the military is that with the government, you're never going to get fired because lack of work. You know, there's always something to do with the government. Job it's security. Be, job security, right. So, you know, when I was looking for that second career, I said, well, I, I want to do government. So I started looking at government agencies and companies that were catering to, to the government, like Boeing and aerospace. My background is electronics. I have a degree in electronics. So I'm looking for jobs that have to do with electronics, but with the government. So, you know, I, I didn't sign for my third enlistment. I was down here in Florida when I left the military, but we moved, you know, personal reason, we moved back to Philadelphia. Went to the federal building on 6th and Arch, the William Green building. And at the time, you had to go into the lobby, and there's a little office, employment office. And I think it was a lady behind the, the counter. So when I walked into that little office, there was a poster with Uncle Sam pointing at me saying, the FBI needs you. And right on the uh, Uncle Sam, there was a list of support positions, and one was electronic technician. And I'm like, ha-ha, I can do that. So I grabbed an application, went home. I fill it all in with black ink because I didn't have a typewriter. I send it in, and about a couple of weeks later, I get a letter from the FBI. Mind you, I don't know what the FBI is. I open the letter, and it says, Dear Mr. De Jesus, thank you for your application to work with the FBI. Unfortunately, we had no openings for electronic technicians. Then second paragraph said, however, you meet all the qualifications to apply for a special agent position. And I'm like, what? Special agent position? I didn't know what that was. And this letter was signed by special agent Jerry Williams, special agent's recruiter, Philadelphia Division. <laughs> and I said, well, if this Jerry Williams thinks that I can be an agent, I'll give it a try. <laughs> so I, I called the office because I think the letter said that you had to call the office to get that you know, application that was like 10 pages long. So I called this lady named Barbara Donnelly, yeah. and she sent me an application. I filled the application. There was no internet, no Google at the time, so I had to go into the Philadelphia Public Library, check out some books on the FBI, and learn everything about the FBI, which when I did, I said, mm, I want to do this. And that was the mission. It was to get a, a spat in Quantico. And you really had no idea of uh, or had ever thought about federal law enforcement or the FBI Not, before that letter came to you? The only thing I knew about law enforcement was my uncle was a police officer in Puerto Rico, and I remember seeing him, and I remember that everybody hated him because he was a cop. And my sister-in-law's husband was a uh, military police. That was the only knowledge I have of law enforcement. I was asked to do that applicant coordinator position when I had less than five years in the Bureau because at the time, the Bureau was really trying to get more minorities and women in the FBI. And the and, language program. Too. And the language program. I did it for three years. I enjoyed it, but I couldn't wait to get back to investigations. And I spent most of my career working white collar crime, economic crime, chasing down con men. I can say that one of my proudest uh, accomplishments was getting you into the FBI. Try not to let you down. So <laughs> I, I worked very hard. <laughs> One of the things that you forgot to mention is the, the full circle of your agent application. And of course, you entered looking to get a job as an electronic technician, but you did get to use those skills eventually in your FBI career. I was drafted to go to San Juan because of the Spanish need down there. I did three years of it, crazy years down there. You can only do three years in San Juan because you're going to get burned out. So I got to Philadelphia. I worked drug cases. And then you get to a point where, where it started, you know, repeating itself. You know, it's time for some else to do. So the domestic squad was looking for people. And I worked there for a few years. 
then the tech squad would have openings. And so I joined the tech squad. I worked five years with them and did some great cases there. I, th- I know you have a podcast with JJ where he uh, talks about, I think it's the, the four Dick six. Dave Brooks and myself were the agents doing all the installations for that case. There are going to be some people listening who have no idea what a tech squad is. They might not have had a chance to listen to J.J. Claver's episode. So could you give us a, a, a brief a definition of what happens on the tech squad? Well, the tech squad is a unit in a lot of the offices, FBI offices, that handle all the electronic monitoring done by the FBI body recorders, all the way to room recorders, video cameras, tracking, entries into places to to do uh, installations. You don't have to have a degree in electronic to be in that squad because we have the, the training center down in Quantico that you get trained in everything, anything that you want to do, including carpentry, electricity, welding, all that you can learn in the test squad because the agents there are specialized creating something to hide your recording. Our work is pretty much undercover. Everything is covered. Your vehicles are covered. Everything is covered because you don't want to be known during the FBI because we did a lot of things at, at night and you enter places and you don't want people to recognize. That was a lot of fun. I did that for five years and it was a lot of crazy things that you do. A lot of things you can't talk about it, but it's amazing the technology that was there and how we use that technology to help the agents solve the cases. And Billy, uh, what about you? I mean, what made you interested in becoming an FBI agent? Well, my story is a little bit different. I grew up with a father who was a police officer in Scranton, and I used to ride around in the car with him or go down to the precinct. So law enforcement was a natural attraction. And I had checked out a book in the FBI when I was in second grade, and I thought, well, that'd be a neat career, and it always stuck with me. Uh, the Bureau was not hiring when I graduated college, so I went to law school, and during law school, I worked on a county narcotics task force because I was a good typer, and with drug work, there's a lot of paperwork, search warrants, title threes, all kinds of affidavits, and I also think because my dad was a police officer and had a good reputation in the area, there was a lot of trust given to me. And at that point, I met a couple agents, Frank Noonan and Charlie Grubert, who were out of the Philly division, the Scranton RA. And at the conclusion of a wiretap, Frank Noonan came to me and said, hey, you work out as an agent. He gave me an application. The bureau still wasn't hiring. I finished up law school. I got a job as a state narcotics agent out of Wilkes-Barre, the Region 8 Strike Force. And sure enough, within six or eight months, I was called. Like around 1995, there was a really a big wave of hiring and have absolutely loved it. It's a wonderful career. It's all up to you. That's the best and worst thing about the FBI. You can make the most out of it, no matter where you're working and what violation you have. And I would never, ever change anything. And I kept a good attitude. I was asked to move over to counterterrorism in 03, and I did that for about six years. I worked some white collar. I worked the WMD program, and I finished up with the 305, the pedophiles, and that was tough, but the Bureau provides a tremendous amount of support in that area. All right, so what are you both doing now? Well, we both work for Disney, so we're still together. (laughs) Ozzy has been my Yoda throughout (laughs) the past 23 years. Yeah, we work with Disney Cruise Line, security department for the cruise line. When I retired in 2014, my wife and I and I wanted to move down to Florida because of the weather, tired of the snow. So I started flying for a lot of jobs with Disney. The cruise line had an opening, and this is funny, the cruise line had an opening for a someone that worked with video, the CCTV program on the cruise ships, which I was in the test squad for five years, and I know a little bit about video. I said, hey, that's the job I wanted to apply. So I applied for it, and I... Lo and behold, I got a call from the recruiter saying, yes, we want to interview. I interviewed for the job on the phone. Then I came down to Florida to do in-person interview. But then the position changed. I was no longer being interviewed for the CCTV coordinator. I was being interviewed to be a security manager. So when I got here, I asked, this is different. I said, oh, don't worry. We'll explain to you later. 
So I applied for one job and got hired for something else. Hey, that that was like, before, it's like the FBI. <laughs> <laughs> so as a security operation manager, I, I handle all the investigations on the ship, HR, investigations of claims against the company, criminal investigations. I do the CCTV still, and I do the access control to the ships and the reports. And then I was bored and tired and lonely and said, I need Billy here with me. So I recruited Billy. So Billy, what do you do with us? Oh, I work in emergency operations. So I feel like I've hit the lottery twice. Once with the Bureau and now with Disney. So I'm a very lucky person, which is why I'm writing the book. Wonderful things in life. No matter what's going on around you, you can always be happy about something. I think that's true. I'm, I'm in the process of reinventing myself. So I totally understand. We are now at the point where I like to turn it totally over to my guests by asking you for the last word. So who wants to go first? Ozzy? Well, preparing for this, Jerry, I started, you know, reminiscing of the days of being in the, uh, in the FBI and trying to compare the experience to, you know, other than having my kids, you know, and, you know, be married and the family join the FBI. It was probably the best thing I ever done in my life. And even though I'm happy with the job here with, with Disney, there's nothing to compare to that experience of being in the FBI for 23 years. It's something that I, to me, it was like I hit the lottery when that happened. When I got that letter from Special Agent Jerry Williams saying that I qualify for a special agent. Billy? I, I echo Ozzy's sentiments. I just feel very lucky. The best thing about the FBI, I think, is the people. You work with some absolutely incredible people and you have to be flexible, and you have to be diligent. You have to understand that things won't come to you. You have to work and roll up your sleeves, and there are some more difficulties now than when I was on the job, but it is still a very worthwhile profession, and the FBI is still a very honorable agency and does tremendous work. I'm very proud of the work that this next generation is doing. And that's the end of the interview. At jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of Billy Ebersol and Ozzy de Jesus, as well as short bios for each of them. There's also photos of the 1,000 kilograms of cocaine and those big metal chlorine gas containers they were hidden in, and newspaper articles about the case. I hope you enjoyed the episode and that you'll share it with your friends, family, and associates. If they're not sure how to listen to a podcast, have them read the post on my website, How to Listen to a Podcast. And don't forget to subscribe to FBI Retired Case File Review on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. I would also love it if you checked out the link for my books and your podcast app's description of this episode. My nonfiction books FBI Myths and Misconceptions, a manual for armchair detectives, which goes through 20 cliches and misconceptions about the FBI and books, TV, and movies. And then there's the companion book, FBI Word Search Puzzles, fun for armchair detectives. My FBI Philadelphia Corruption Squad crime series features flawed female FBI agent Carrie Wheeler in Pay to Play and Greedy Givers. All of my books are available wherever books are sold as ebooks, print books, and audiobooks. If you've already picked up copies of my books, please consider leaving a review. Reviews help readers find good books. Thank you for listening to the very end, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.